Welcome to the Tax Factor, the top 20 business and investment podcast from Blick Rothenberg, the tax, accounting and business advisory firm. This week with Nimesh Shah and Roger Holman. Welcome to The Tax Factor, our weekly podcast from Blick Rothenberg. Each week, our team of experts looks at the news and updates in the world of tax and provides an analysis for what it means for you or your business. I'm Namesh Shah, and joining me this week and making their Tax Factor debut is private client partner Roger Holman. Roger, a warm welcome to The Tax Factor, and normal service is resumed this week after our autumn statement and SDLT birthday specials. Roger, in true Tax Factor style, let's kick off with a favourite, and I are 35, as there's been a high-profile case involving Loose Women TV presenter Kay Adams. This has been a long-running case between HMRC and the TV presenter, which has gone in favour of the taxpayer. So, Roger, just take a moment to remind our listeners about what the IR35 rules are and how these provisions impacted Kay Adams. Thanks, Namesh. IR35 is essentially a bit of shorthand for some rules that were introduced 20 to 25 years ago. These were really aimed at stopping employees setting up their own little companies to do their employment. The reason a lot of people did this was back in the early noughties, when corporation tax rates were very, very low for small companies, people were able to pay themselves a little salary from their company. Normally, it was just below the national insurance level, and then top this up with dividends, which were also taxed at a much lower rate than their salary. Now, obviously, the government didn't actually like that, so they introduced the IR35 rules to treat personal services service companies as effectively transparent. That meant the income was largely going to be taxed as salary. Now, that was the government's view of what was happening. They obviously thought it was all about tax. And obviously, when we get into businesses, it's actually not as simple as that. At that time, there were a lot of IT contractors working for big companies like BT. Now, these big companies didn't like having lots of people on the payroll. And so they told those employees that they needed to actually work through their own company. As I say, one of the reasons is they keep the people off the payroll. But another big reason is actually these contractors then don't get any employment rights like sick pay and holiday pay. Obviously, that saved those big companies like BT huge amounts in HR costs. Since the introduction of IR35, the working landscapes changed quite dramatically. And obviously, now we've got the advent of the gig economy making more flexible working practices really prevalent. But generally, IR35 was meant to catch people who just just worked for a single company through their own intermediary company. And that's where the Kay Adams case comes in. Kay, as we said, she's a prominent broadcaster, journalist, and most recently known for appearances on Loose Women. The case in question was actually brought about by HMRC to look into the fact that her company, it was called Atoll House Productions, actually supplied her services to the BBC between 2015 and 2017. Kay always maintained that she's a freelance journalist and presenter, and if you look her up on Wikipedia, her work history shows that she's actually worked for pretty much all of the main UK channels over her career. Coming back to IR35, obviously this was aimed at contract who primarily work for a single company and then change their status from employee to contractor. It wasn't generally aimed at the freelance journalists. Sort of unsurprisingly to most tax advisors, Kay has won this case because actually she is a freelance journalist and had control over the provision of her services. So in effect, she was actually self-employed. Thanks, Roger, for a real good history lesson there on IR35. And it's always surprised me these rules have been around for over 20 years. And really, is the distinction between someone being self-employed and employed. And I think you touched on something that the government really don't like these rules. I suppose the government really don't like self-employed individuals and definitely self-employed individuals who have operated through companies because there's been lots of changes in this landscape, not at least the IR35 rules, which have then extended the burden on the employer as well to assess whether someone is employed or self-employed, the so-called off-payroll working rules. But Roger, you've been doing a bit of blue sky thinking about IR35 following the autumn statement announcements and the reduction to national insurance. So as just a quick reminder, from January, employees' national insurance is going to be reduced by 2% for earnings between roughly 13000 and 50000 meaning an annual tax saving for an employed worker of just over £750. For the self-employed, Class 2 national insurance is going to be abolished, which is good news. That's a simplification to our tax system. And Class 4 NIC for profits between, again, roughly 13000 and 50000 are going to be reduced by 1%. But that 
that's not effective for the self-employed until after April 2024. So Roger, those NIC changes announced by Jeremy Hunt in the autumn statement got you thinking about IR35. Please enlighten us. Yeah, I mean, as I said at the start, IR35 rules were created at a time when we had a really low corporation tax rate, low dividend tax rates, and at the same time, we had relatively high national insurance rates or national insurance kicked in at a very low level, and personal tax rates were reasonably high, although obviously current tax rates and fiscal drag is causing a real problem with personal tax. Probably not a thing to go into at the moment. Now that employee national insurance has been cut, but the dividend tax rate still has an effective NIC imposed on it, which was done a couple of years ago when they increased the national insurance contributions, the differential between employed and self-employed or using a personal service company actually now probably favours the employee. Now, the maths on this is really complicated and it depends on different circumstances and I've not gone through all of the different situations, but that's kind of my gut feel. And so as a result of that, it sort of feels like the IR35 rules for a tax avoidance are kind of dead in the water. I really hope someone from the Treasury or HMRC have listened into your explanation there, Roger, because I think you're spot on that given the NIC changes that we've had, the IR35 rules don't feel particularly needed now. So hopefully there is a simplification on its way in the future. And this would be a massive relief for, I know, contractors operating through personal service companies if we could do away with these horrible rules, as well as the employing entity or the contracting entity who has to deal with these off-payroll working rules as well. I know our colleague Robert Salter has lots of fun and games with that. Let's move away from NIC and a quick thought on income tax. And you mentioned fiscal drag just before, Roger. There was an interesting bit of an analysis arising from an HMRC Freedom of Information Act request. So almost a quarter of all income tax and capital gains tax is paid by just 100,000 individuals. And they paid a staggering 55 billion of tax. So 100,000 individuals represents 0.3% of taxpayers. The average income tax and capital gains tax, I'm sure you've worked out, Roger, is roughly 550,000 in 21-22. And that's an increase of 18%. So that's the effect, I suppose, of maybe some of that fiscal drag, even biting those top earners. Even more surprisingly, the top 100 taxpayers in the UK collectively paid 4.6 billion of income tax and CGT in 21 122. So that's 46 million each per person of those 100 taxpayers. And this was more than double the amount paid some five years ago. So look, some amazing figures there. I do not want to have an eye-watering tax bill of 46 million. That would also make me a very fortunate taxpayer. But wow, that those are some staggering numbers and maybe not at the 46 million level, but I think we can see the effect of frozen tax allowances even at that top end. Let's move on to another tax and turning attention to VAT. A casualty of some soaring energy prices collapsed energy provider bulb was hit with a 1.3 million demand relating to VAT. It should have paid in relation to a refer a friend scheme, which I know was very popular. I think I may have used it actually back in the day. Uh, So Roger, I know that isn't your specialist subject. And this was a particularly complex case. But at a high level, how did bulb get it wrong? Thanks for throwing this one at me, Nimesh. Um, I'll do my best on this. As you said, I'm not a VAT expert, so it will very much be high level. The Bulb scheme worked actually by giving everyone who signed up to Bulb a link to send on to their friends. Now, if the person clicked that link and signed up, both they and the friend got 25 or 50 pound, depending on whether they were switching one or both of the utilities. Most of the time, that amount was just credited to the bill, although it was open for the individuals to take the money as cash. And it looks like this might have caused Bulb a bit of a confusion in their accounting. So let's assume the um, electricity bill is 100 pounds and VAT on that is of 5% on that that's £5. Now, where the reward was offset against the bill, Bulb also then reduced the VAT. And that is what they've actually got wrong. The VAT should have actually been based on the £100, not the amount less the reward. Thanks for breaking that down so simply, Roger. Uh, You may have a career in VAT at one point. It's ironic that HMRC could have been contesting a case against itself as Bulb was bailed out by the taxpayer, although it's not completely clear if it was the taxpayer or Bulb's new owner, Octopus Energy, that will foot the tax bill from the case notes. And on the subject of HMRC and HMRC customer service, we do talk about that on the tax factor a fair bit, and their challenges and their continued reluctance to answer the phone 
Roger, why can't we still get through to HMRC on the phone? Well, to put this simply, they just want to reduce their staff costs. And so they think that everyone has access to online resources. HMRC's Director General for Customer Services actually said that there is no need to spend time waiting to speak to us. Using our online services for simple queries about your tax return means you can get the help you need quickly. We have a wealth of free resources and support online to help you complete your tax return. Now, this obviously just goes to show that HMRC expect everyone to ask Google rather than HMRC. Or maybe ChatGPT, but I know that we've had some challenges getting answers out of ChatGPT and some quite weird answers that come out from the AI. I think we're going to be in jobs for some time, Roger. And finally, it is officially December and it is Christmas party season and Roger and I celebrated the Blick Rothenberg Christmas event last week. But tax could have a habit of dampening the festive mood. So if you are planning on hosting a Christmas party for your employees, there is a long-standing and helpful tax exemption for the cost of that perk. Although I should say it's been set at that level since inception almost. So provided the cost of the annual event does not exceed more than £150 per person, you don't have to report a benefit in kind as an employer. But watch out if you do have more than one annual event and Blick Rothenberg are very generous to their employees. Uh, we have a summer and Christmas event. So if the total annual cost of both events exceeds £150, the whole cost of the second function would be a taxable benefit. Now, in most cases, the employer will make good the tax for the employee through what's called a pay settlement agreement. But it's definitely worth keeping an eye out so you don't breach that limit. So HMRC could become the festive Grinch if you're not careful. My thanks to Roger for joining me on this week's episode of The Tax Factor. Roger is going to go and try and get a hold of HMRC. We may have an update for you next week's episode on how successful he was or wasn't, or he may still be on hold. Thanks for waiting. One of our advisors will be with you as soon as possible. We've covered three big taxes in around 10 minutes today, which account for almost three quarters of the total tax take in the UK. I think that's pretty good going for an episode of The Tax Factor. We also want to hear from you. If you visit the Tax Factor page on our website, you'll find a form to contact us. Let us know the stories and topics you would like us to cover. We record the podcast on a Wednesday, so you can message us right up to the time we record. We can't give individual advice or responses to messages, but do let us know what is on your tax mind. You can hear all the previous episodes of the Tax Factor on the Blick Rothenberg website, and we release a new episode every Friday on all the popular podcast platforms. That's all for this week. Next week, Rihanna Earl and Ellie, our R&D tax partner, are lined up to talk about all things Glow Mobility and R&D. So it should be a real mixed bag. I'll be back for a festive special of The Tax Factor and our last episode for 2023. I'm Nimesh Shah, CEO at Blake Rothenberg. Goodbye and enjoy the weekend. That's all for this episode of The Tax Factor. Find all our previous episodes wherever you get your podcast. If you enjoyed this podcast, why not try Brave Business, our podcast series for entrepreneurs. Find it wherever you get The Tax Factor or on the Blick Rothenberg website. The Tax Factor. <laughs>